Okay, so I, I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. I just have some notes, and uh, here the, the I have to share the podium with um, uh, uh, the, the entrails of the pig, uh, good, good company. Um, so I, I guess I'd just like to uh, uh, begin the way I begin, um, you know, really most of the uh, uh, speaking that I do and just sort of like uh, you know, address the question, what is fermentation anyway, and, uh, and, 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 and why is it so significant? Um, so broadly speaking, fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, if you have a biology background, you might already be shaking your head. Um, uh, biologists definitely have a more specific uh, notion of fermentation, and that is that it is um, the production of energy without oxygen, anaerobic metabolism. Um, and, you know, indeed, most of the most widespread ferments that people enjoy um, are products of anaerobic microbial processes, the production of alcohol from uh, different kinds of sugars, the production of uh, yogurt and, uh, and many cheeses from, uh, from milk. Um, but there are some ferments that require oxygen. They're sort of the oxymoronic ferments. Uh, and some exa examples of this would be uh, vinegar, um, kombucha, tempeh, certain kinds of cheeses. And, and really, uh, everybody um, on the ground understands that these also are examples of, uh, of, of, of fermentation. So I prefer to work with this uh, you know, broader lay definition that fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. But it's really important to understand, and we all understand this in a very visceral way, that not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we wish to put into our mouths. And, you know, in fact, most of the food that we discard, we are discarding precisely because of the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, and generally, we, we reserve this word fermentation to describe a desirable or intentional microbial transformations. Um, but, but I think that you know, the fact that microbial uh, transformation can go many different ways gives us a little bit of insight into the inevitability of microbial change. And so, uh, you know, as, as, as Herbert laid out, you know, our human bodies are these complex, um, you know, microbial ecosystems. Um, and, you know, the number of cells that we each possess that reflects our own unique individual DNA code are actually outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria that we are host to. And human beings are certainly not unique in this regard. Um, you know, every biological creation is covered with microorganisms. And the evolving consensus in evolutionary biology is that all life is evolved from bacteria. And the flip side of this, which doesn't get talked about quite as much, is that no form of life has ever lived without bacteria. Um, um, you know, we, 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 we all, you know, from a, from a, you know, carrot to a bee, uh, to a bird, uh, to an animal, um, you know, to, to this pig, um, um, you know, we, we, we all are these complex uh, uh, microbial ecosystems and, you know, our physiology interacts with all of these uh, bacteria. So, you know, this... Uh, this complex biological reality, this biological imperative that we must coexist with bacteria, um, uh, contrasts sharply, I think, with um, uh, you know the indoctrination that you know certainly we, we receive it you know very very strongly in the United States, but I suspect that uh, you know through the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century and most of the rest of the world, um, um, you know there is this cultural project that I that I like to call the war on bacteria, and that's this indoctrination that bacteria are bad, bacteria are to be avoided, bacteria are to be uh, killed. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't really observed this here, but that I can't really read Danish, but, uh, you know, in, in, in the United States, um, in public restrooms everywhere, you find these soaps that are antibacterial soaps that, uh, you know, sort of market themselves on the premise that they kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria. And it's really come to the point where there's nothing more alluring that you could write on a container of soap than the promise that it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, you know, as if that were a desirable thing. 
Um, you know, because, it, you know, I, I don't want to deny that it's possible to, you know, become ill from bacteria. There are bacterial infections and bacterial illnesses. But the reality is that what protects us from the relatively small number of bacteria that have the potential to make us sick are the 99.9% .9 of bacteria that we can coexist with perfectly well. And beyond coexisting with them, we are utterly dependent upon them. Um, you know, many aspects of our functionality depend upon bacteria. Uh, beginning with our reproduction, human beings cannot effectively reproduce without bacteria. And women's bodies produce a, a glycogen, a carbohydrate, that, that um, uh, supports a, a, an a, a, um, a, a population of lactic acid bacteria that create an acidic environment that enables us to effectively reproduce. And without those bacteria, we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, uh, you know, and then, then you know, the, the, the trillions of bacteria uh, in our digestive system enable us to effectively digest food and assimilate nutrients from the food that we eat. And they also synthesize certain essential nutrients on our behalf so that we don't have to find them in our food. And we're learning more and more, uh, really every year, um, but, but what we call our immune function is actually regulated by these trillions of bacteria uh, in our gut um, and, and, and other aspects of our physiology too. Uh, 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 just in the last year or so, there's been exciting research uh, uh, looking at how uh, serotonin and other uh, you know, uh, chemical compounds uh, in our bodies that regulate how we feel and how we think are actually regulated um, by bacteria in our gut. So they're you know, they just utterly uh, essential for so many um, aspects of our, of, of our functionality. Um, and so, so there's this sharp contrast between um, you know, the biological reality and um, the, 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 the sort of, you know, ideological indoctrination that sort of, uh, you know, the, the age of microbiology has, has yielded, which is this, it's this fear of bacteria. Now, I mean, I first, uh, I first began playing around with fermentation uh, about 20 years ago. I, I'm certainly not a professional chef. I love to cook. I always have loved to figure out, uh, you know, how to make anything from, from scratch. Uh, 20 years ago, I moved from uh, New York City, uh, where I grew up, to um, a community in rural Tennessee where I got involved in, in, in keeping a garden. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reasons for that were, were many, but, uh, you know, among them was um, concern about my health. In, in, uh, in, tw in 1991, uh, 22 years ago, um, I tested HIV positive, and... It just made me start thinking about my health and, you know, thinking about my life and how I could change my life to support my health. And the idea of sort of moving out of a, a, a big, busy, polluted city to a, a rural area uh, where there was spring water and I could grow my own food just seemed like a, uh, like a healthier way of, of, of life. So that, that, that was a, a big piece of what sort of made me ready to make a change like that in, in my life. And when I got involved in keeping a garden, um, well, I was such a naive city kid that I had never really thought about the idea that, like, each vegetable would all be ready at the same time. Um, so, uh, you know, so when my, when my, you know, row of cabbages were, were all ready at about the same time, um, I thought to myself, well, I better learn how to make sauerkraut. Now, I knew that I loved sauerkraut, and even more than sauerkraut, uh, uh, sour pickles, uh, 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 fermented cucumber, uh, 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 garlic and dill pickles, um, uh, which, are, which are really uh, uh, commonly found in, in, in New York City. Um, and so I always was like drawn to this flavor of, of, of lactic acid, but I had never done it myself. So, I mean, I really just opened up a couple of cookbooks and saw the process. It is incredibly, incredibly simple to make sauerkraut. Um, and, uh, you know, I chopped up my cabbage. I lightly salted it. I squeezed it and mashed it a little bit to get it all juicy. I stuffed it into an old crock that I found uh, in the barn in the community. Um, and, uh, and I kind of got obsessed with, uh, with sauerkraut. I mean, probably, you know, at all times since then, I've had some sauerkraut going. Um, and then I started playing around with making yogurt and cheese making and uh, making elderberry wine and 
blueberry wine and blackberry wine and, you know, what we in Tennessee call country wines. Um, and then I started, you know, uh, uh, baking with a, with a sourdough starter. Um, and then I started investigating some, uh, you know, more exotic ferments. I learned how to make miso. I learned how to make tempeh. Uh, and it just became a sort of all-out personal obsession. And my friends started uh, calling me Sandor Kraut uh, because I was, I was always showing up with, uh, with, 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 with sauerkraut. Um, and then I started getting invited to, to, to teach small workshops. I, uh, I had some friends in Tennessee who were turning their family homestead into a sort of eco-education center, and they invited me to teach a sauerkraut-making workshop. And the first time I saw, taught a sauerkraut-making workshop, which was in uh, uh, 1998, 15 years ago, um, what I learned is that there, there is, you know, for those of us, you know, raised in the context of the war on bacteria and this idea that bacteria are so uh, uh, dangerous, um, there's a huge fear that many people have. So, um, you know, the, 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 the biggest question that came up that day and that has been sort of repeated to me hundreds of times through the workshops that I've done and through my website, um, you know, is how can I be sure that I'm getting good bacteria growing and not bad bacteria? You know, uh, what about botulism? I don't want to kill my children. Um, you know, people are, you know, many people are just paralyzed by fears like this. Um, and, uh, y you know, basically, I mean, you know, uh, fermentation, um, you know, because of this, you know, inevitability of microbial change in our food, you know, for people all over the world, um, you know, people had to learn how to work with the presence of microorganisms on their food, um, because otherwise it would sort of decompose their food into something that nobody wants to put in their mouth. So, you know, millennia before, you know, we had the tools to identify specific microorganisms, um, you know, people in every part of the world learned to work with these invisible life forces that are present um, on, on, on all food. Um, and, you know, the practical applications of fermentation, you know, beyond the most widespread form of fermentation, which is the production of alcohol, um, which, um, uh, you know, is a, is a transcendent experience that, um, you know, sort of was really, has been used as a, as, as a sacrament, uh, you know, by, by, you know, varied cultural traditions really all, all around the world. But, but beyond alcohol, you know, the, the practical applications of, of fermentation are, are food preservation. I mean, for us in the 21st century, um, we have a warped perspective on food preservation. I mean, we, we all have a fermentation slowing device in our kitchen. That's what a refrigerator amounts to. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, canning, the idea of sterilizing food a, in a can, I mean, you know, that was invented in France in the 1800s by Nicolas Apert. It's called apertization in, in France. But really, like, up until then, you know, there were basically, uh, you know, three methods of food preservation uh, known to humanity. You know, one would be drying, one would be heavy salting to, uh, you know, prevent microbial growth, and the, the, the third would be fermentation. So fermentation is just an incredibly important mode of preservation. Um, uh, you know, sauerkraut, the general idea of fermenting vegetables, uh, which really spread all across the Eurasian landmass and, and, and many other places, you know, particularly in temperate environments with limited growing seasons. This was how people could have the nutrients, notably vitamin C, that are, that are you know, primarily found in, uh, in, in, in plant foods that aren't available for much of the year. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a, a highly perishable food like milk. I mean, it's hard for us to even imagine milk uh, uh, outside of the context of refrigeration. And indeed, fresh milk, um, you know, what I imagine uh, uh, most of us grew up with is really a phenomenon of the 20th century and, and the emergence of widespread refrigeration. Um, but, but, you know, soured milk, you know, yogurt, uh, kefir, um, uh, uh, cheeses, you know, hard cheeses, like that's a very stable form of milk that, uh, you know, we might be used to putting it on a in our refrigerator, but you don't need to. Uh, cured meats, you know, salamis, you know, this is a way to, you know, if you're a family that's been raising, uh, you know, the pig that, 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 uh, that, that Dario was uh, uh, um, uh, gutting this morning, um, you know, that, that's how you're going to preserve it if you don't have a freezer and a refrigerator is by, is by curing the meat. Um, so, so there's a really practical application for, uh, 
Um, you know, and, and, and really not only for preservation. I mean, it's also certain foods uh, are detoxified by fermentation. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're poisonous or contain, uh, uh, you know, toxic compounds, and the fermentation breaks those compounds down. Uh, fermentation makes foods more, uh, more digestible, um, uh, uh, and it gives them flavor. Like, if you look around at, you know, gourmet food stores anywhere in the world, you know, the foods that we elevate on this pedestal uh, and, and, and celebrate as, as gourmet foods, really the highest expressions of pretty much every culinary tradition, are products of fermentation. So they create extraordinary flavors, not always flavors that everybody can agree on, um, you know, some of the flavors of fermentation are, you know, what we might call um, acquired tastes. Um, um, you know, okay, so this is a pretty self-selected group. Like, how many people in this room would identify with the idea, you know, the further away I can smell a cheese, the more excited I am to eat it? Okay, but, okay, so, so even, even for this self-selected group, that is a minority. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'll buy a piece of really stinky cheese and I invite some friends over and like some of my friends will, you know, come into the door and be all excited to eat it. And then other people will get to the door, open the door, and they'll say, did something die in here? And, you know, and they would never for a minute think about putting it into their mouths. And, you know, all around the world there are examples of fermentation that, uh, you know, people who grew up with them love to eat. And, and frequently people from outside uh, uh, the culture find them extremely uh, uh, inaccessible. Uh, last night at dinner I was hearing about some of the um, uh, traditions of uh, fermenting meat and fish uh, uh, on, the fa on the Faroe Islands. Um, uh, and it sounds like that, that, that's certainly an example of that. Um, when I've tried a, a Swedish sur strumming, that's, a, that's an example of that. A Japanese natto, uh, that's an example of that. Um, um, but in a way, these foods that, 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 that frequently uh, people outside of the culture find um, you know, even repellent, you know, serve to reinforce cultural identity. Um, uh, because it is this sort of, you know, shared uh, experience that, that people who, who share it recognize that most people outside of their group um, have a hard time um, uh, 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 sharing. So, 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 there's this, so there's this disconnect. Um, but increasingly, you know, what I've learned uh, uh, teaching about fermentation, trying to demystify it and, and empower people with skills to make these incredibly easy and safe foods, um, uh, is that people are getting interested in it for the perceived health benefits of fermented foods. And, and certainly, you know, fermentation transforms foods nutritionally in, in, some, in some dramatic ways. I mean, uh, you know, uh, fermentation can be thought of as pre-digestion. It breaks down dense compound nutrients into sort of simpler, uh, uh, more elemental forms that, that it's easier for our bodies to, uh, to, um, to assimilate. It removes uh, certain toxins from foods. It contributes additional nutrients, you know, a few of which, um, uh, you know, have, have been investigated. Um, and, and these are like metabolic byproducts of specific microorganisms that, that have turned out to have, um, uh, you know, extremely beneficial um, uh, uh, qualities for, for human beings. But, you know, what I would say is the most uh, 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 profound nutritional benefit of fermented foods is not really found in all fermented foods, but it's, it's in the fermented foods that haven't been cooked after their fermentation, and that is the live bacterial cultures themselves. And historically, nobody ever had to think about replenishing or diversifying the bacteria in their gut. But because we're living in the midst of the war on bacteria, and more than an ideology, it's, it's chemical warfare. It's, you know, antibiotic drugs. Um, uh, it's antibacterial cleansing products. It's chlorine in the water. I mean, it's all of these compounds that are used specifically to kill bacteria. And when we're ingesting these compounds, and really even if you never take antibiotic drugs, we all are ingesting antibiotic drugs because they're accumulating in the water table because of their heavy use. Um, um, but, but, but basically, the, the, the gut bacteria in all of us are under continual assault. And so, you know, in the 21st century, much more than uh, in, in, in times past, it's become, you know, important to consciously replenish the bacteria in our gut. 
And one way people do that is little capsules called probiotics, but because you know, all of the you know, greatest delicacies of the world are products of fermentation, there are lots of incredibly delicious bacterially rich foods, and really a variety of bacterially rich foods is a much more effective probiotic than any single strain that somebody, uh, that, that, that somebody manufactures in a, in, in a capsule. Um, so, so there's this like there's this disconnect. Let me talk about one other uh, 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 disconnection, and that is, you know, it's very exciting for me to be, uh, you know, invited here. Um, you know, I, I I I am not a chef. I live in a rural area. I don't have many uh, fine dining opportunities. Um, uh, but it's very exciting to me that. Um, you know, many chefs around the world are, 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 are getting more interested in practicing fermentation um, in their restaurants. But I get all this feedback, uh, you know, both from people who are trying to start small local fermentation enterprises um, and also from chefs who are, uh, uh, you know, wishing to incorporate fermentation into the practices in their kitchen. Well, that all of the, you know, so be, because the central dogma of food safety at our, in our historical moment is this idea that it's dangerous to eat food that sits sort of out for, you know, more than a few hours at temperatures above refrigeration temperatures. And, um, you know, while, while you know, I, I, I can appreciate the, the general idea that, you know, keeping food under refrigeration as long as possible in general is a, is a healthy practice in a food service situation, if it were intrinsically dangerous to eat food that had sat for more than four hours outside of refrigeration temperatures, we wouldn't be sitting here talking today because our species never could have perpetuated itself because we've only had the ability to keep food at refrigerated temperatures for a couple of generations and really that and it, and then only in the most affluent parts of the world so um, so you know many of the, the the people attempting to sort of negotiate with their sort of inspectors um, who are trying to enforce health codes um, uh, you know, th this is just a, a disconnect, you know, because, because these foods fall outside of sort of the central dogma of, uh, you know, of, of, of food safety and how it is sort of frequently um, uh, uh, um, applied by, by uh, you know, enforcement agents. Um, so, you know, many food manufacturers uh, uh, trying to get into fermentation have to basically educate their inspectors. Um, you know, some restaurants, you know, just try to make sure their inspectors don't notice the things that they're leaving out to ferment because really, you know, all ferments, um, you know, occur in, you know, what the uh, sort of food safety dogma would, would, would describe as the, as the danger zone. Um, of, of temperature. So I, I think that this is a really interesting disconnect that, you know, as fermented foods become, you know, more uh, uh, popular again um, uh, and, and the production of them becomes more mainstreamed and, and, and uh, disperses beyond the factories where they have been, you know, taking place uh, uh, in, uh, in, in recent decades, um, you know, I think we have to address this, uh, this, this, this disconnect. So now I just want to talk for a moment about uh, about reconnection. Um, you know, actually, you know, I, let me just back up and say one thing. Like I told you all that I tested HIV positive. Um, I wrote on the back of wild fermentation that fermented foods have been an important part of my healing. Many people have misinterpreted that and think that I said that, uh, you know, I cured AIDS by eating sauerkraut. <laughs> and let me be very clear that, that, that I, like, I do not want to, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there, 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 there are definitely some, uh, uh, snake oil salesmen who are sort of, you know, trying to convince people that, you know, different specific fermented foods, uh, you know, will cure different specific things. You know, there are anti-carcinogenic compounds in sauerkraut. Does that mean that if you're diagnosed with a brain tumor, all you need to do is eat a big plate of sauerkraut every day? I don't think so. Um, you know, our health exists in a much broader context. I think, you know, these foods as a group, by, uh, b by uh, enabling us to improve digestion, improve, improve nutrient assimilation, improve overall immune functioning, that is huge. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for, you know, someone suffering from a chronic disease process, for someone with a, a brand new health crisis that, that they're dealing with, for someone who feels like they're the most strapping specimen walking the, the earth, uh, for someone who's just feeling the effects of aging, you know, improving digestion and nutrient assimilation and immune functioning is amazing for anyone. So, so I think that there, I, 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 I sincerely believe that, that fermented foods are part of what keep me, uh, you know, healthy and, and, and vibrant, but I, but I think that it's misguided to assume that they're going to be the cure for any specific uh, uh, disease process. 
Now, I just want to talk for a moment about, uh, about reconnection. I mean, you know, food is something that, you know, sort of connects us, uh, you know, with biology, uh, with, 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 with culture, uh, you know, with, with history, uh, you know, with, with desire. It's the embodiment of, uh, of all these different things. Now, the word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. Um, and it's because the, the, the visible action of fermentation in liquids is bubbles, the same as the visible action of boiling. And the word yeast comes from Greek zestos, which also means to boil. So our, our vocabulary of fermentation is all about sort of its, its analogy uh, uh, to, to, to heating food and, and the bubbles that are created. But there's a metaphorical uh, 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 connotation of the word fermentation, and people talk about cultural ferment, political ferment, social ferment, uh, intellectual ferment, uh, spiritual ferment, and, and, and really this is a metaphorical application of the same idea, like the bubbles, because when people get excited, you know, periods of change, periods of excitement, when people believe in change, when people believe in, uh, you know, ideas that get them excited, they get bubbly. Um, and when you feel bubbly about ideas that are, that, that are inspiring you and you, you, know, you want to talk about them, you want to share them. So, uh, you know, really what I want to leave you with is the idea that, you know, in addition to being, you know, this, this uh, you know, amazing mode of food transformation that is used, uh, you know, really in every part of the world, you know, that fermentation is also an important uh, engine of social change. So uh, I thank you today, and, uh, and let's uh, have, a, have a great rest of the time.